Okay, so this will be a short lesson on the advanced application of conservation of linear momentum. I'm assuming students have had a cursory introduction, which includes the uh, basic idea behind conservation, uh, as well as the fact that if no external forces are acting on a system, the momentum of that system uh, will remain constant. Uh, and that they've also seen some basic collision problems and are able to solve them relatively well. Uh, the purpose of this lesson is to allow students to see a complicated problem broken down into simpler ones, and then uh, the basics that they already know applied in order to solve the complicated problem. And uh, the hope is that this will give them some confidence in solving problems they haven't seen before. Uh, and by the end, the students will hopefully have um, some intuition into the workings of rocket propulsion. So to begin, let's imagine a firework which is flying through the air with some speed v naught, And at some time later, an explosion occurs within the firework, which separates it into two pieces, a rearward piece and a forward piece. We'll say the rearward piece has a velocity, a final velocity v1, and the forward piece has a final velocity v2. So let's see what we can say about these final velocities, given what is up here. Uh, so using linear algebra, you know that you have to have um, as many knowns as unknowns to fully solve a system. Uh, in this situation, we have two unknowns, the final velocities of both pieces, and one known, the initial velocity of the entire. So, seeing that, uh, you realize that you cannot fully specify these given the information. You actually need more information. But, um, you know, let's see what we can say about it. Uh, so, let's draw a box around this system, and we'll say that this is our closed system. Uh, as you can see, between this point and this point, there's no external forces reaching into the box and acting on the firework. So you know that uh, the momentum of this system must be equal to the momentum of this system. So let's imagine that this box is fully specified by its center of mass. So the only unknown we have is the velocity of the center of mass. And given what I just said, uh, you now have one unknown and one known. And because nothing's acting on it, the final velocity of the center of mass must be the original velocity of the center of mass. So no matter what sort of crazy path these two pieces take, their center of mass will continue to move along a straight line with the original velocity. So now let's take a look at a problem where I give you a little bit more information so you can say more about what happens uh, after an event. So let's imagine a man who is holding two boxes. We'll call this mass M1, we'll call this mass M2. And let's say this entire system is flying through the air at some v naught. So let's say sometime later the man decides to throw one of the boxes and hold on to the other. So the man holds on to this initial box, throws away the final box. So we'll call the final velocity of the man in this box, v1, called the final velocity of this box, v2. Now, essentially this looks exactly the same as the problem before, but I'm going to give you one more bit of information, which is that the man has a radar gun, and after he throws the second box, he reads that this box is traveling at a speed c. So what that means is that the difference in his velocity and this velocity is c. So we'll go ahead and write that out. And you see that v1, which is his velocity, minus v2, which is the other box's velocity, is equal to c. Okay, so uh, let's also let's take a look at the problem and see if we can uh, solve it yet. So we have two pieces of information, this one and this one, and they are both independent. And then we have two unknowns, the final velocity of the man in the box and then this box. So uh, using linear algebra, we know that this is a solvable system. So let's go ahead and uh, run through the math and see what we come up with. So uh, first thing I'm going to do, uh, just to simplify the problem, is I'm going to say that the final velocity of this box is going to be the initial velocity of uh, the system plus some delta v. This is just purely convention. I'm just doing this because it will simplify the math. Uh, so given this, uh, we, given this one right here, we can say if we rearrange that v2 is equal to v1 minus c. So plugging this into here, you can say v naught plus delta v minus
minus c is equal to v2. So let's go ahead and rewrite these just like we did over here. Okay, so if you look at the problem again, I've now changed it into a problem with one known and one unknown. So the one unknown is delta v and the one known is v naught. This will just make the problem easier to solve algebraically. So now let's go ahead and apply conservation of linear momentum. So let's draw a box around our system before and after the event happens. Now you can see that there's no forces reaching into either of these boxes uh, in between the time of the events. So you know that the initial and final momentum must be the same. So let's go ahead and find the initial momentum of this system called PI. And this is going to be equal to the mass of each of its constituents multiplied by their velocities. So because they both have the same velocity, we know that this is just going to be m1 plus m2 times v0. Okay, now let's take a look at the final momentum of this system. We know that it's going to be the mass, this mass times its velocity. plus this mass times its velocity. Okay, so because we know that delta P equals zero, which is PF minus PI, we go ahead and write out an equation using these. So you have zero, and I'm gonna go ahead and just run through the math just for time's sake. But if you subtract this minus this, what you will get is M1 delta v plus m2 delta v minus m2c. So if we isolate this delta v and rearrange, we can solve for delta v, which is going to be m2 over m1 plus m2 times c. So as we can see here, delta v is a positive quantity. So what we, if we, we can rewrite it and find the exact velocities of both of these pieces. But let's just step back for a second and look what's going on. Um, because delta V is positive, the final velocity of the man and the object he's holding onto are greater. So in a way, this is like a propulsive device. He's accelerating himself. One way you can think about this is if he's holding a cannon and firing it backwards, uh, he will be, like the recoil that he feels will actually accelerate him in the direction of his opposite He's firing. So if you imagine that M2 is the cannonball and he's holding the cannon, he'll actually be traveling faster in this direction, so everything makes sense. Okay, now let's try taking this example a little bit further. Instead of the man holding just one box, imagine that he has many very small boxes. And instead of just throwing it out um, once, he throws out each little box one at a time over and over again. So there's a rate at which he's throwing them. If you take the limit to which um, you know the time in between throwing the boxes is zero, so he's basically continuously throwing boxes as fast as he can, uh, what's going to happen is every time he throws a box, he's going to get some speed increase. So this is sort of like a propulsive device that someone could use to travel faster. And um, I don't expect you to follow the math right now, but I can go over it later if you'd like. But basically what happens is this equation in that continuous limit turns into this. It turns into uh, the acceleration of the man is equal to the rate at which he's throwing back mass times the speed at which he's throwing back mass divided by his mass at any given point in time. Now we can actually rearrange this equation slightly to be his mass times his acceleration is equal to the mass flow rate times the speed at which it's leaving. And we know that someone's mass times their acceleration is also the force that they're feeling. So what we can say here is that the propulsive device that this man has created or the, uh, results in a force which is equal to the mass flow rate, m dot, which is the speed at which he's throwing back mass, times the speed at which the mass is leaving. So he's essentially created an engine that's propelling himself forward, and this is the rocket equation. This explains uh, how force is developed through rocket propulsion. And you can think of it this way. Think of each of the small masses that the man has as little bits of gas. So at this point, 
This is the man and his rocket, and this is sort of his gas. Now what happens in a rocket is an explosion takes place which causes the throwing of the backwards mass, which is actually just gas. So as the explosion takes place, there's a force on the man which accelerates him forward. So essentially that's how a rocket works.